ask for what you can only do, but that you love to do, which is give us more of yourself in this church, in this body. So we look to you, Jesus, for this. Amen. Well, thank you for praying with me. Let's go ahead and turn in our Bibles to the book of Exodus, chapter 20. We are going through the Ten Commandments. And uh, so as you're turning there, we'll also have it on the screen for us. But we're going through the Ten Commandments, looking at it, not as a policeman, but as a dental hygienist, not as a, uh, a guilt trip, but as a growth path. So now that you have the security of Jesus Christ, now that you've been forgiven, how can you begin to walk in his ways, to love him with all of your heart? Well, he's given us a summary of what that looks like in the Ten Commandments. So we've looked at, uh, we're doing a countdown, 10, 9, 8, and today is the Eighth Commandment. So read this with me, and then we'll pray briefly, and then uh, study this together. So it says this, you shall not steal. You shall not steal. That's the word of the Lord to us this morning. Uh, Would you pray with me and ask for him to teach you and meet you in this place in this time? Father, come and illumine our hearts. Shine the light of your word and spirit deep within our hearts that you would overcome any uh, place, any hardness in our hearts, that you would scrub us with your spirit, with your mercy, until we are blindingly, blazingly glorious, uh, even now in this world, um, as we will be in the world to come. So, Father, we ask that you do this. Amen. So the Eighth Commandment is pretty simple. Don't steal. And I was thinking about uh, the fact that as we're coming to this, unless there's some shady stuff going on in your heart, it's going to be a pretty simple commandment. Unless you're, like, running a money laundering ring on the side, uh, you probably don't see yourself as stealing in this kind of surface way, you shall not steal. And so there's a challenge here for us in terms of seeing the relevance of it for our lives. Don't steal, I don't. Good morning, have a great Sunday. (laughs) But really here, if you can uh, trust the Lord that he has so much more for us in this, and really when it boils down to it, the 10th commandment, looks at our heart's relation to everything, but especially stuff. The ninth commandment looks at our words, our relationship with our words and with truth. That's relevant. The eighth commandment here looks at our relationship to our stuff or to the stuff, to the materials around us. And that's pretty relevant uh, if you ask me. Stuff. Our hearts love it, we want it, we like it, it's good, we think, but there are ways that it can rule over us. And so, really, when you think about don't steal, it's helpful to put it in this frame of what is your relationship with stuff, and how can you grow in your relationship with God related to his stuff? So we're going to tackle this in three aspects, and we're going to start with this. We're going to go from taking, to making, and then to giving, to sharing. From taking, to making, to sharing. Now, I'm not brilliant enough to come up with that. You probably didn't think that was brilliant in the first place. But every time you study the Bible, especially in the Old Testament, you want to look for the places in the New Testament where you have a guide on how to apply it. If there's a passage where the apostles who sat with Jesus take a truth and apply it, you know that if you're applying it similarly to them, you're in good hands. Or if Jesus himself takes a commandment and applies it, as we'll see in the seventh commandment and the sixth commandment and the fifth commandment, you know you're in good hands. And so actually one of the places 
where this commandment shows up in the New Testament that guides us is in the book of Ephesians. In this one little, it seems like a throwaway verse, Ephesians 4. Paul's giving these instructions. He's reminding his people here, and he kind of throws this out, but it's very relevant to us this morning. And it says this, Ephesians 4, verse 28. Let the thief no longer steal. That's the first part of the verse. And we're gonna look at that first here. Let the thief no longer steal. Now, this is neat. When I was studying this, uh, one of the aspects uh, that I didn't really realize was that this grounds the idea of private property. It's, it's kind of strange to say it uh, just out there, so I'll give you some context. By saying don't steal, it implies or it presupposes that things belong to someone else. Therefore, you shouldn't steal them. Why does this matter? It matters in our world today because, I, number one, uh, there was a panel with these past couple of years of looking at the, our church's response to racism and issues in the past. And one of the issues that this panel discussed that I was sitting and watching uh, it was African Americans, it was um, white people, there might have been more ethnicities represented, but they were working through these issues of race in the church together. And one of the issues that they kept coming up against was this idea of Marxism. And I know this is a, you know, a culturally hot topic because uh, you know, BLM has been open about Marxism and I just didn't even know much about Marxism or capitalism or ways of economics. And if I thought I, I didn't like Marxism as I learned about it, I didn't really know why. If I liked the idea of not Marxism, why? And a lot of, for a lot of us, it's because we were just, we're American. We grew up in America, or maybe you're just raised by someone who grew up in America. And so you hear Marxism, and you're like, ah, oh, that might be bad, or like, is it bad, or what? But here, in this discussion, in this panel, these people were talking about, were addressing the issue of Marxism, and they took it back to the Eighth Commandment in a way that I hadn't seen before. So some of you, you may know this, but part of what the Eighth Commandment teaches us is that it presupposes private property. It presupposes that if you make it, it's yours. You own it. God gives it to you. And part of what Marxism today and the push for Marxism is this idea that everything is owned by everyone. And because we're so bad at putting that into practice and sharing, the state has to come in, the benevolent state, and take things from everyone and distribute them. So that's this idea of Marxism, but as these African-American pastors were arguing with other African-Americans saying, are you saying capitalism is godlier? Are you saying capitalism as a, as a way of economics in our nation is godliness? This is what these pastors explained. They said, no, we're not saying capitalism is godlier or godly or the chosen way. But we are saying this, if there's a system of organizing our economics that begins with the idea that you don't own anything, at least we can say that's not biblical. So for all of the different ways that are biblical of organizing a society or even a church, one that presupposes that you own nothing or everyone has a right to your stuff is off the table. This was helpful to me in, in, in filtering through how to understand culture and what's going on. I would hear these arguments of capitalism, of uh, Marxism being taught, and I had no idea what to believe and why. Very relevant and practically, the Eighth Commandment comes in with this presupposition when it says don't steal, part of what it presupposes is that someone owns something in the first place. So if you find yourself opposed to Marxism, 
Don't let it be because you're American. Don't let it be because you're a Republican or Democrat that chooses that system of economics. Let it be because you see all the way back in the Bible how God has given people things and they own them. They own them. So that's one aspect here of this uh, commandment, don't steal, is that it presupposes private property and that has massive implications for you, for what you're teaching your kids, for what you're interacting with in our culture here. Another aspect here that is in this don't steal commandment, it goes back to coveting. So when I, when I taught on the 10th commandment, I took it in a broad sense, which you can do. I took it to kind of show the fact that what God aims at in your life is more than just your actions. What God aims at in your life is your heart, your desires. God wants all of you, and he will have all of you. That's true. But coveting specifically uh, links up here with the eighth commandment because coveting in its more narrow form is stealing in the heart. So coveting shines the light on all the commandments saying there's an internal component. But coveting specifically is stealing of the heart. And I didn't come up with that. In fact, I read that after I preached on it. And as is the case, I usually read the best quotes or most helpful pieces of information after I preach a sermon on it. So here, when we're looking at coveting and we're, when we're looking at stealing, one of the aspects that godly people have used to guide them uh, all throughout the past is this. It's not just external, it's internal as well. Am I stealing in the heart? So listen to this. These are some more expansions of this. What's required in the Eighth Commandment? What's required are this. Truth, faithfulness, and justice in contracts and commerce between human and human. Giving everyone his due. Uh, returning of goods unlawfully detained. So returning things that have been stolen. All of these things that we would understand are, are external. But then it says this. And this is what people a long time ago, Christians a long time ago, have seen. Moderation of our judgments, our wills, and our affections concerning worldly goods. Moderation, the right relationship in our hearts, in our desires to the things of this earth. Not just don't steal, not just don't defraud people, not just don't have an unlawful or ungood or ungodly profession, but also just in the way that you judge things, also in the way that you want things to have a right relationship with things there. And that is actually very difficult. That's actually very difficult. So the positive side of this, what's required is this, a full contentment with our own condition. Full contentment with our own condition. But in addition to that, a charitable frame is what it says towards our neighbor's condition. We not just want to, to not steal ourselves and to be happy with what God has given us, but we actually want our neighbors to succeed in all that they do in their relationship with things. So we find that what starts out as seemingly a simple check it off the list command, do not steal, actually folds out into all of life from what we do all the way to what we think and feel. So kind of what starts out here is from taking. So we go back to Ephesians 4, 28. Let the thief no longer steal. Let the thief no longer steal. So in your relationship to the things of earth, Use this time where you're sitting in the chair with the dental hygienist of the Holy Spirit, where he says, here's a little bit of plaque here, and he starts scraping it away. Where are you, especially today in your heart, uh, not content or discontent 
with your own situation in life? Where do you want things that you don't have and you're a little bit frustrated that the Lord hasn't given it to you yet? Where is that plaque that the Spirit can bring the grace of Jesus Christ and begin to chip away to soften your heart? Where are you fine with yourself but you're not that happy when you see other people succeed or you really just don't care? Where can the Spirit begin to chip away at your life. You're not stealing outwardly, but your heart is stealing inwardly, or at least it's covetous inwardly. So that's pretty simple. That's taking. So we're going to go from taking, but Ephesians 4 helpfully pushes us further from taking to making, from taking to making. So Ephesians 4, let me let it continue here for us. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands. So the apostles are taking us and guiding us to applying from taking now to making. So I've been reading about this more and more. It's called quiet quitting. Quiet quitting. Uh, There was an article about a year ago uh, online that I came across, and there was an article this past August from the New York Times detailing this uh, phenomenon called quiet quitting. And it means different things to different people, but what they're seeing is this. There's a lot of videos. You know, now people, when they want to share something, they make a video about it and share it that way. So there's a lot of videos coming out of people quietly quitting. And so they're trying to understand it. People, employers are trying to understand it. And this is part of what they're seeing. So Zaid Khan, a 24-year-old engineer in New York, posted a quiet quitting video that has racked up 3 million views in two weeks. In his viral TikTok, Mr. Khan explained the concept this way. So this is his way. You're quitting the idea of going above and beyond in your work. You're quitting the idea of going above and beyond. He continues, you're no longer subscribing to the hustle culture mentality that work has to be your life. Now this is interesting for me to read through and watch because what I'm seeing in this is a struggle. It's a struggle of the right relationship, not just from stuff, but from how to make stuff, your work, your labor. And there's this struggle out there of what should the right relationship between my life and my work be? What what is the right work-life balance? And I know that many of you have struggled with this as well. So we read something like, don't steal, or rather let him labor, let each labor, doing honest work with his own hands, And we're wondering how to apply this. How do we, where does the heart actually draw the line between a work-life balance? And the whole world is wrestling with this as well. So the Eighth Commandment actually is very relevant to the whole world in this. So Mr. Khan says that he and many of his peers reject the idea that productivity trumps all. They don't see the payoff. So part of what's driving them is this. They don't see a payoff. They work, they overwork, they deny family, they deny themselves, all for what? A shot at the American dream that is slowly becoming more and more out of reach. Or they see what they've put behind and they realize that they've let work dominate all that they are. And when they search for it and they finally get there, they see that it was not all that they had promised or been promised, it was. Now, some of this is just laziness. So this is like the, uh, for some people, you know, I was reading these quotes. Some people, I was like, that's just plain old, that's just plain old lazy. So Ephesians 4 would say to him, let the thief no longer steal from your employer, but rather let him labor doing honest work, doing good work. And so this verse, this commandment in this verse helps guide us already, helps guide the world in doing honest work, but also seeing a limit to work. And we'll see that coming up 
here in the last part. But part of what Christians throughout the ages have seen as they've asked God to guide their hearts in a new life with Christ is this. Not only does it it presuppose private property, this commandment presupposes a work ethic. Don't steal. Okay, now what do I do? Labor. Labor hard, labor honestly. Earn what you have. And all throughout the New Testament, we see that. One of Paul's most famous instances is talking to a group of Christians who are so sure that the Lord is gonna come this week that they give up their work. They all quit and they're sitting around. Right? They're singing Kumbaya with their acoustic guitars. And Paul comes in and says, if you don't work, you don't eat. Let everyone work here. And so that, Christians have seen this throughout the ages. Martin Luther, John Calvin were some who saw the importance of getting right the mix between work being a part of your life, not all of your life, but definitely a true and honest part of it. So one historian is writing about their influence of what's called the Protestant work ethic. And he says this, Medieval Catholicism at the time emphasized that the spiritual higher life, if you really want to be spiritual, it's found in withdrawal from the world. Christians should withdraw. Christians should be celibate. Christians should be poor. I don't know if you've ever been to a sermon, a sermon, been to a sermon, been to a church where you've heard a sermon that you are not giving away enough of your money, you selfish person. Is there a little bit of that medieval Catholicism, that perfection, spiritual perfection, is found in poverty? But here's where the reformers brought the Eighth Commandment to their situation. Actually, this historian continues, Spiritual growth is found in family life, productive labor, and cultural engagement. God calls each of us to various tasks and relationship. We have callings in our family through marriage and being a part of a family and parents. In the workplace, whether as master, servant, or exercising our different roles to make a living. And in the culture, as citizens of a city, of a town, as rulers, as subjects, We also have a vocation in the church as a congregant or a pastor or an elder or a musician. All of these callings and roles have their place in the Christian's life. But here, they emphasize as well, the spiritual life is not mainly in the church. The church is a place that you come and then are filled up to be sent out with the Spirit back into your world. So rather than withdrawing from the world, there's an engagement with the world, an engagement with labor. Early on in seminary, I think I believed that riches were bad. Riches were ungodly, but rather, as I began to study the Bible, and so much of seminary uh, taught and challenged my preconceived notions, I actually saw that riches were a blessing. They had always been a blessing in the Old Testament, and even in the New Testament, The commands against riches are not don't be rich, even though they go to the rich young ruler. We can preach on that some other day. Jesus saying, give away all that you have. Rather, what they say is this. Let the rich not put their hope in their riches. Let the rich not give in to the snare that money has often on so people. So money, love of money is a root of evil, but it's not evil. So here we have from the the commandment leading us from taking to making, from taking to making. And so a question that I want you to begin to formulate is this, what is your relationship to work? Where do you struggle personally? And this would be a great conversation to have with me or with a friend uh, in this church, a Christian who's wondering the same thing. Where is my work-life balance off? On Where am I quiet quitting in the bad way of 
of scraping by? Where am I not doing honest work with my own hands? Or where am I maybe too committed where I'm neglecting the other areas and callings of God on my life? So from taking to making, but now to sharing. So Paul in Ephesians 4 ends that verse by this. He, he deals with the taking, let the thief no longer steal. He deals with the making, rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands. But then he takes it one step further, and this is the most difficult for us to get. So that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Let the thief no longer steal. Let him labor with his own hands for the purpose of giving it away to those in need. This is difficult for us because we know, in a sense, that the private property is ours. God has given it to us. It doesn't belong to anyone else. It belongs to us, right? Secondly, we made it, and riches are good, and we're supposed to have them and use them well to take care of our families, to take care of others. We made it. It's ours. So then how do we transition to the point where we then give to those in need? The big answer, one of the big answers is this. It's God's money, ultimately. In the Garden of Eden, God gives Adam all of it. He says, have dominion over it, but always that reminder of do with it what I've given it to you to do with. Use it for my glory. So in one sense, the answer is this. Even though it's ours, it's God's above ours. It's ours to use, to steward well. But most of us know that. And so I'm not even gonna spend time on that as much. Really, a lot of us in the church recognize that the money we make is ours. We recognize that we've worked hard to get it and it's good. But what holds us back from being more generous with it? From giving it away, as Ephesians 4 says, to share something with anyone in need. So, back in Deuteronomy chapter 8, this is what God says to his people. God brings them out of Egypt through Moses. And he says, I'm gonna have a better life for you. I'm gonna give you a land flowing with milk and honey. I'm gonna give you everything physically, materially you need. You won't have to hunger. You won't have to thirst. Your storehouses are gonna be full. Your animals are gonna be multiplying like crazy. You're gonna have everything you need. But this is what he says to them through Moses in Deuteronomy chapter eight. Take care though, lest you forget. Lest when you have eaten and are full and have built good houses and live in them and when your herds and flocks multiply and your silver and gold is multiplied and all that you have is multiplied, take care that when your heart is lifted up that you don't forget the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, who led you through the great and terrifying wilderness with fiery serpents and scorpions and thirsty ground where there was no water, who brought you out, water out of the flinty rock, who fed you in the wilderness with manna. Beware lest you say in your heart, and here's where it comes to us, my power in the might of my hand have gotten me this wealth. There is this interesting layer here that is hard to see, but crucial to all of it. And it's the layer of instruments and sources, or means and source. When you're hungry, how does God provide for you? Through food. 99.999999 times out of a hundred, when you're hungry, you eat food. And yet, the Bible is clear that it's God feeding you. And the way we know this is because that God says to his enemies, even when you eat food, it won't be satisfying. 
And yet, even when I give you little flakes of manna, it will be satisfying for you. So God can satisfy us with or without food, even though the overwhelming majority of the time, he satisfies our bodies with food. But you look at Jesus, and when he walks in, he goes 40 days and nights. He takes away the means. Everyone thinks, this guy's gonna die. Satan thinks, I'm gonna lead him out. And if he continues to not make this rock into bread, he's gonna die, and I'll have him. And yet, what God does in this moment is he removes the means, and yet the sustenance for Jesus is still there. He's getting at what God is reminding them in the book of Deuteronomy, that even though you have money, and money is 99.9999% of the way that I take care of you, don't forget that it's I who take care of you. I can make your money worthless, I can make it abound and supply, I'm the one, don't forget that I'm the one that provides for your security. I'm the one that provides for your comfort, for your joy. And so part of what takes us as Christians today from not just taking it and not just making it, but to giving it is this. Jesus Christ is the one who has secured for us God as our source. Money is ordinarily the way that we make sure that we're secure and safe. You buy an alarm system, you put it on your house. Ordinarily, that's your security. But what God says to Christians is this. Even without an alarm system, even when you forget to turn it on, even when ADT doesn't come in time, I'm your safety. I'm your safety. You can be free from the love of money and begin to give because you know that the source is still there. Jesus Christ secures for us all that we normally cling to our money for. I'll admit it. I don't like being, not being able to buy something that I want. Retail therapy feels awesome. But when I remember and don't forget that Jesus Christ is the source of my comfort, I can be fine not spending on that and even giving to those in need. They didn't deserve it. They don't deserve it, and yet I'm free to give. And the only way that happens is if you don't forget or you remember, or maybe for the first time you realize that you didn't earn a thing. You don't deserve a thing from God, and yet through Jesus Christ, he has given you what he has earned. The path forward for us is not just not taking, although that's a big part of it. So stop money laundering. The second step here is in making. God allows you to begin making honest work with your hands. I know there's situations where you can't find work and that's hard, but he moves us beyond this as Paul teaches us in Ephesians, not just making and taking, but to giving, to generosity. And he does that through his son, through his gospel, freeing our hearts from clinging to what we think is our fear, or is our comfort and is our security. So in all these ways, we should remember that Jesus Christ is all that we need. And so I'll close with this quote. It's a quote from a Christian, a very poor Christian. He says this. Keep your life free from the love of money. Be content with what you have. Why? For as he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. The Lord is with us. So let's go ahead and pray and ask for his help in our lives in this area. Father, we come to you and ask that you would Make us confident again in your love for us in Jesus Christ. That because of him, 
you will never leave us or forsake us. Father, I pray that we would be an honest church, people, a hardworking church, people, and a generous church and people. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you will never leave us or forsake us. Lord, we praise you for this. Help our hearts to praise you. Amen. Would you stand as we sing this song of response to the